Hello, and welcome to Neighbor International's joint webinar series on implications of the global pandemic on tariff design and utility finances. This is the last webinar in our three-part series, which is supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development. Today, we are discussing transition plans and cost recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm Erin Hamill, Director of International Programs here at NIRUC. Many of you are familiar with our international programs. Due to travel restrictions, we continue to develop remote-based options to further our interactions with our foreign partners. We hope you are on our email distribution list for volunteer opportunities. If not, please feel free to send me an email and we'll add you to our list. A word about our polls. We have several polls throughout the session today. In order to be able to participate, we recommend that you exit from full screen mode. Let's go ahead and check out our list of registrations and participants and see where our registration registrants are from. Great, let's look at our poll results. So we have a large contingent from North America and Europe, and then we also have participation from Latin America, the Caribbean, and Asia and Asia Pacific. That's exciting. We are delighted to have our colleagues from the Council of European Energy Regulators, SEER, in Belgium, the Energy Regulators Regionalist Regional Association ERA in Hungary, and the Association of Canadian Energy Regulators, CAMPA, as co-organizers for this webinar series. We look forward to a lively discussion on the next steps regulators and utilities are taking as we transition out of the emergency phase during the pandemic. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our webpage. If you do have questions for the speakers, please use the chat box within the GoToWebinar panel to the side of your screen to send us your questions at any time during the webinar. The panelists will be responding to audience questions during the Q&A section at the end of the presentations. Before proceeding, I should mention that the opinions expressed herein are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of U.S. Agency for International Development or NARU. We would like to thank the generosity of the American people for supporting this webinar. To kickstart our conversation, we are pleased to have NARU First Vice President Paul Schillander share his thoughts with opening remarks. Mr. Schlander serves as president of the Idaho Public Utilities Commission and plays a leading role on several critical electricity and telecommunications advisory committees. Mr. Schlander. Good morning, Erin, and uh, thank you very much for helping to pull this together. Um, as regulators, we spend a, a great deal of time talking about reliability and resilience, and, and now we get to add a new R word to the list, and that's relevance. Uh, I bring the word relevance up mostly to illustrate just how important I think it is that forums like this one uh, continue during the pandemic. And, and I especially want to thank USAID, NARUC, SEER, ERA, and CAMPUT for staying relevant throughout this worldwide crisis. It would be far too easy to simply cancel events and, and wait until later to begin addressing the needs of our associations and constituents. And that would be the easy way out. But if we waited to hold events like these until things returned to normal, well, we'd be wondering if, if anyone really cared what it was we had to say. But by continuing the work of our organizations and associations for this crisis, it really helps ensure that when the COVID-19 event is behind us, we don't have to try to figure out how to be relevant because we remained relevant throughout the situation. With that in mind, again, I wanna express my gratitude to all the organizations that played a role in putting this event together. As uh, was mentioned by Aaron, the topic today is transition plans and cost recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. From a personal perspective as, as a regulator, I'm struggling to make every effort to try to be fair, just, and reasonable as we deal with the uncertainty that this crisis brings to the table. Uh, in my rural state, probably the most significant concern that we've experienced is a, a surge of past due delinquent utility bill accounts. From the very beginning of the quarantine, we suspended normal utility collection practices and disconnection activities like a lot of other states have done. And so far, our four major Idaho utilities have seen a total increase in past due bills of about $6.5 million, and that number continues to, to climb on a weekly basis. Now, when compared to the same period in 2019, our utilities are seeing an increase in past due bills of roughly 50%. 
unconfirmed reports suggest that most of the current delinquent accounts are from customers who routinely and annually find themselves with past due amounts. But of the total number of past due accounts that we're seeing now, about one third are purportedly new to the delinquent account list. As our state begins to reopen, we're going to be lifting the current ban on disconnection of past due accounts. And when that occurs, every effort is going to be made to try to avoid disconnecting service by allowing customers to establish payment plans to pay off their past due amounts. But we know that no matter what we do, there's still going to be delinquent accounts that won't be collected. So how will we deal with that is the big question. Obviously, there are various tracking mechanisms that we've already put in place, but we simply won't know the full impact until this pandemic comes to an end. And none of us has any idea when that will occur. And the questions we ask is, will there be a phase two and a, or a third wave? Because that will probably significantly have an impact on the increasing number of past due accounts. We also have no idea how many businesses will ever reopen again. And we also don't know what the pandemic might do to forever alter the energy use profiles for some of our large industrial and special contract customers. So there's still a great many unknowns surrounding the full financial impact of the COVID-19 crisis in the utility sector, which again is why I see this webinar as being extremely valuable to me as a regulator. So again, I want to thank all the participating organizations for stepping up to the plate and placing this topic on the front burner. And with that, I'll pass it back to Aaron Hamill. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner Schoenander. We appreciate your time. For today's webinar, we're very excited to have David Boyd, a former commissioner from Minnesota, facilitate this important conversation. Many of our international colleagues know Mr. Boyd from his prior role as a commissioner, as well as his senior role at MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. Mr. Boyd? Thank you, Aaron. Uh, I, I want to express my gratitude to USAID for this whole series. Uh, as a former regulator, I'm still trying to track these important events, and uh, I couldn't agree more with the comments of President Shalander. I think he's set the table nicely. Uh, if you'll indulge me for just a moment, uh, I have a few uh, comments that I think are in line with what President Shalander had, had offered, but I also want to make sure to leave plenty of time for the distinguished panel we have uh, assembled for you today. Uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that we're grappling not just with economic issues, but with loss of life. The disruption from the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic demands that we try to look forward and ask what the future may hold for the regulated utilities and their customers. These shelter at home policies, while life-saving, have also led to load disruption and decreased revenues for the electric suppliers. Uh, but also high unemployment and financial uncertainty for the customers as many businesses close their doors. And as you'll hear, you've heard from President Schlander, but you'll hear from others, many states and countries have offered short-term relief to these customers. Those actions are in stages uh, preparing to be lifted in many jurisdictions, but bad debt is climbing and the future is far from certain. We really can't have uh, say with any certainty how long the medical emergency will last here in the U.S., much less understand or predict the economic fallout. The regulator has an obligation to customers, but also to maintain the financial health of the utility and, and balance must be struck to be fair to both parties. But where is that balance in a situation like this? If, if the balance tips too far in one direction, customers may not be able to pay their bills, which further diminishes revenue at a time when unemployment is high, foreclosures are up and personal peril is likely allow the balance to fall the other direction and utilities, essential service providers of telecommunications, natural gas, water, and electricity lose their ability to provide clean, reliable, safe services or stop investing in their networks. And uh, this crisis will undoubtedly create a parade of rate proceedings that commissions as utilities seek relief, probably at much the same time, which can overload the limited staff of the regulator. The timing of that action is a matter of local statute or rules, though most jurisdictions in the US do have an emergency trigger that could apply here. So the question for today is how can regulators manage the workload associated with the financial fallout of the pandemic? And how should the burden, financial burden be apportioned between customers and utilities? Uh, we do have a, a great panel of four experts to share their ideas and expertise with us today. They represent Nehru, Camput, Sear, and ERA. 
Uh, we'll take them sequentially in the order you see them on, their, on the screen, starting with Mr. Petrikoff uh, across to Dr. Scott, Commissioner uh, Arginyan, and finally Dr. or Mr. Morton. And then we will have a conversation at the end, a discussion among the participants, but we also look forward to your participation by submitting questions through the chat function. So with that, I, I think I'd like to move on and introduce uh, Mr. Petrikoff. Uh, Mr. Howard Petrikoff is a former commissioner and former chief analyst at the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio, the state of Ohio and the United States. Mr. Petrikoff, please. Thank you very much and welcome to you all. And could I have the, the, first, uh, the first chart? Uh, thank you. Well, what we're gonna do in, in these opening minutes here is I want to talk about the the impact that the COVID-19 infection has had um, on utilities, and then look and see in the, if you will, the regulatory toolbox, what tools we have to to deal with the problems, at least as we're we're seeing them at the moment. And what we're seeing at the moment basically is that the combination of fear of the of the uh, uh, infection, uh, 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 along with government shutdown orders, uh, uh, created recession conditions. Utilities are experiencing significant reduction in customer revenues. Uh, that means that there's a reduction in, in utility sales, so to the degree that the tariff structure, you have to sell kilowatt hours or cubic feet of water in, in order to, to, to have a revenue. Those, are being, those revenues are being reduced. And as we've discussed thus far, the inability of customers who've had their, their businesses closed or their orders dry up because of the uh, uh, of the recession conditions to pay their utility bills. On top of that, utilities have additional costs that that have um, sprung from the uh, from the pandemic. They they'll have um, the, the cost of personal protective gear for their employees, added sanitation materials and operations, and increased labor costs. Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so it, we have immediate problems and then secondary problems that grow out of these impacts from the uh, coronavirus. Uh, the first is is the uh, is a non-payment by customers, and the looming shutoffs of those customers. Um, obviously, there's a cash flow crisis for the, or could be a cash flow crisis for the utility that looks to the payment of bills in order to fund ongoing uh, operations. Um, there's also a secondary one in that. Uh, a lot of the capital structure of some utilities are dependent upon their cash flow. In other words, there are covenants in bond or loan provisions in which you have to have a certain uh, revenue flow or net revenue flow uh, in order to maintain the interest rate that you have or, or to make additional um, uh, 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 or have additional borrowing. And that can be disrupted if now because of customers inability to pay we're we're having a reduction in the um uh, in in the cash flow also the in terms of the shutoffs at uh, uh many states and i know w this is true in, in ohio we have a moratorium on uh, on shutoffs but the day will come when uh, when that moratorium will be lifted uh and then the utilities have that problem if you if you do shut off the customer or drop the customer account um uh, uh, how much do you spend going after the, the lost money? And will those customers return? Is it better to try to give them terms and, and keep them on? Um, the other thing, and these are sort of the, the secondary or longer term impacts that we'll have once we get past the, the immediate problem of the, uh, uh, of the pandemic. And that is a lot of utilities uh, need the, the revenue flow to have retained earnings and it's the retained earnings that's going to be used to to um, make further investments and to and to build out the uh, build out the system. Uh, furthermore, economic health is important in the ability to raise capital uh, and to borrow. Uh, so these are these are are, are uh, uh, raise financial problems for the utilities that that regulators are going to have to to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Well, the first tool in the toolbox, if you will is the emergency rate increase. Um, all the states that I'm familiar with have some version of an emergency rate increase, and they're all pretty similar in, in, in their basic features. Uh, generally, because these are emergencies, so you have to put them into effect quickly, 
uh, they tend to be in the of the surcharge nature. So rather than redoing the 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 tariff or the rate design or the structure, you add a dollar on the customer charge or you add a a mill on a kilowatt hour charge in, in order to raise the um, in order to raise the, the needed revenue. And since these are emergencies, they tend to be of short duration. Um, and the uh, regulators, of course, audit and review those to make sure that that the money is is being collected and going where it should be going. And generally, with uh, uh, emergency uh, surcharges, we have trackers. So there the, there may be a, a target amount that's that's necessary uh, to get you through the uh, the the pandemic, uh, but that will be watched by the by the regulator and. If too much money is collected, it gets returned to the customers, and generally the, the similar form in which it has been collected. If there's not enough, we either have to extend the time or or up the rate. The the pros of the of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, emergency surcharge is that they're generally well accept, accepted, probably in, in large measure because they tend to be of short duration, um, and they keep the same rate design. The, the problem you have is that it exasperates the shutoffs because now you've just raised the amount that the customer has to pay. And, and it could trigger for areas that are in uh, economic problems outside of the, of the emergency, the, the death spiral. The, the death spiral is, is the, the economic term for when you get in the situation in which you don't have enough revenue coming in from your utility sales to meet your expenses. So you raise your rates when you raise your rates more customers drop off and the load drops off because basic uh, supply and demand uh, as the price goes up, the volume goes down. Um, and so you have a bigger drop off in your revenue. And so you raise rates again, and hence the term death spiral. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay. Um, besides emergency rates, we also have deferrals. And deferrals are really the, a good tool for for the capital problems. Let's say you have bond coverage issues and you're not getting enough revenue flow to cover them or the, you're, you're going to have an increase because you're, you're not seeing the flow. One of the things that the regulator can do is that um, it can recognize a, and help create a regulatory asset. I couldn't hear what you said. Okay. Uh, the, um, the, the, uh, uh, the the terms of um, uh, uh, of the uh, of the, the the bond coverage are such that you could create the, the regulator could create a um, uh, an a regulated asset and that could be put on the books of the utility to strengthen the books of the uh, of the utility. Now it won't help with cash flow, and it may add interest costs. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Okay. Looking down at at, um, at other tools, the um, uh, we have grants and loans. Uh, uh, grants and loans are, are wonderful because they have no impact on the, uh, on the on the rate design and, and really help out with costs. But you have to be careful because oftentimes the grants and loans come with provisions that may be hard to live with in the in the long term. Um, also, in terms of the shutoff uh, moratoriums. Obviously, you have to to balance health and and social concerns for turning off large numbers of uh, of of customers, and of course that has cash flow um, uh, implications as well. Finally, looking at the um, uh, at, at the other items, you you can rate you can change rate designs. It could be that the pandemic takes out some of the major users, and they're not going to return. Um, in which case the des rate design itself may have to be may have to be changed, as well as re-examining what services are provided uh, uh, and um, what conveniences are and activities uh, can be cut in order to bring costs in line with the new revenue reality. So those are are five thoughts, five tools in the toolbox, if you will, for meeting with the with the pandemic. Uh, I think we all share the hope that. Uh, the pandemic is relatively short-lived and that the recovery is complete and quick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petrikoff. Uh, Christina, I think we have another poll question lined up. 
Here we go. Does your commission have authority to approve a regulatory asset application filed by a utility due to financial difficulties? And we'll pause for the results. All right, looking at the results, it's an overwhelmingly affirmative answer that yes, indeed, uh, the regulator does have the authority to deal with uh, these financial difficulties. So we're gonna move on to our second speaker. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Catherine Scott, Interim Executive Director, Systems and Networks uh, with Ofgem in Great Britain. And Seer, Dr. Scott, it's a great pleasure to see you and to have you join us. I look forward to your comments. You. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to primarily be focusing on, uh, on an overview of what we've been doing at the GB Energy Regulator Ofgem in response to the COVID crisis. But as you can imagine, many of the challenges we're facing as the regulator have also been experienced by um, our fellow energy regulators across Europe. Uh, and so I'm going to also touch on um, uh, on the work going on at SEER. Um, and there are a set of sort of similar solutions that we've been focusing on. Can you move to the next slide, please? So this, this slide sets out a high level snapshot of the actions that we've taken so far as events, as events have unfolded and sort of the actions that we're planning in the future as well. Um, as we emerge from lockdown into what people are calling the new normal, which doesn't feel very normal at all. Um, it's a bit of a busy slide. Don't worry about the coloured boxes. I'm going to come back to the particular examples. Uh, I think it's worth saying at the outset that, like all organisations, we faced real operational challenges. Um, so virtually overnight, we went from being a predominantly office-based um, organisation to one where 100% of our staff were working from home. And we're still working through the continuing challenges and, and the huge opportunities that are presented by that form of remote working. But uh, I'm not focusing on that here, obviously. Um, and instead, I'm going to be focusing on our external response and solutions that we've put in place. So in terms of our immediate response to the challenges, we focused on three overriding objectives, which you'll probably recognize, um, to ensure that customers' needs were met, particularly the most vulnerable, to maintain secure, reliable, and safe supplies of energy to consumers in the short to medium term, and to ensure the safety and protection of consumers and the various workforces. Uh, in a nutshell, the key to our response in the early phase has been collaboration, a level of collaboration that we've not achieved before. Um, we've worked with industry, consumer bodies and government uh, to understand the impacts on the different parts of the supply chain and then to identify and manage immediate risks. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, so as we've moved from immediate crisis management to the stabilisation phase, we've taken a number of actions to meet those overriding objectives. Uh, and I would, I think, highlight three in particular, which are, are, are of interest and perhaps a, a common theme. So in, in April, we published letters setting out um, a framework of regulatory flexibility for suppliers, network companies and the electricity system operator, um, enabling them to focus on COVID priorities. Uh, we've updated that guidance quite recently uh, as we move towards normal business as usual rules, except where companies can't deliver to uh, particular standards uh, because there's a need to comply with government guidance on COVID. Um, secondly, we reprioritised our own work to enable us to focus on COVID and to provide space and, and resilience for industry to manage the situation. Uh, and we're in a process of refreshing those priorities as we emerge from lockdown and we are going to uh, be re-engaging parts of our work program uh, that we held back on earlier in in the COVID phase and we've also worked with electricity and gas network companies to develop schemes that allow um, suppliers to delay retail suppliers to delay payment of up to 75 percent of their network charges which is designed to give them um, a degree of regulatory flexibility um, and uh, flexibility with their cash flow for a few months. These schemes have been implemented now by the network companies. 
um, and we supported them in, in developing those. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. So where are we now? The, the, the economic impact of COVID is obviously very severe, um, even as we emerge from lockdown. So uh, social distancing measures continue, uh, workforce availability and productivity remains a challenge. Um, the Bank of England is forecasting uh, a decline of about 25% in the economy from March to June and unemployment has doubled. In terms of the impact on consumers, payment levels are better than we perhaps initially might have expected. But according to our research, one in four consumers is, is saying that COVID is impacting their personal finances and we very much need to keep this under review over the coming months. Um, for suppliers, low demand along with consumer non-payment could create cash flow uh, and is creating cash flow challenges for some suppliers, especially in the non-domestic sector. The, the good news is that while there were increased levels of, of direct debit cancellations, um, initially this turned out to be less than originally anticipated and widespread self-disconnections for customers with prepayment meters has not materialised. But again, this is an area that we are um, monitoring very closely. Networks have been performing resiliently and adapted um, uh, to protect staff and customers and work reprioritisation. And there's been um, a significant fall, obviously, in, in electricity demand. Uh, which peaked at around 20% lower than pre-COVID forecasts, which um, created some real operability challenges for the electricity system operator, um, which implemented certain tools to, to deal with this, including contracting to reduce output uh, at a nuclear power plant. Um, we've seen a significant rise in balancing costs and have taken action to address this. So yesterday we approved a code uh, change to cap balancing services costs until the end of August and any under recovery of revenue um, will be recovered through balancing charges across um, all settlement periods in 2021-22. Um, but we're now beginning to see demand levels rise again as we emerge from, from lockdown so the future is not entirely clear on that. Um, can we go to the next slide please? In terms of looking ahead, we're going to continue active monitoring across a range of areas for the foreseeable future. So we're, we're continuing to monitor customer service levels, supplier resilience, system operability risk, and, and the cost of balancing actions, network performance, generator health, and consumer debt. Um, in relation to consumer bad debt, uh, we've got some decisions around our default price tariff as to when we reflect um, any bad debt. We think it's too early at the moment to be able to do that, but um, it's certainly something we're going to consider in the future. And about half the population in, in the UK are on um, the default tariff or the prepayment meter price cap. Um, so because of the challenges to the economy posed by COVID and, and the pre-existing challenges of decarbonisation, the, the UK government has been focused in the last few weeks on what's been called green recovery. Um, we're working with government and industry to try and determine measures to support that recovery, including what we can do to prompt investments in the energy industry and innovation and infrastructure assets uh, that will enable us to meet our net zero target in 2050. And so we're in the process of engaging with industry to discuss emerging ideas and next steps. And one example that we're exploring is to support through regulatory means such as the price control the acceleration of investment but we are very conscious of that affordability will remain uh, an important issue for energy consumers in the aftermath of, of this crisis so any contribution we make will need to be very carefully managed um, can you go to the, the the last slide please so throughout throughout this very challenging time we've been um getting important information via SEER, who's acted as a sort of collator of information and practices across member regulators. Um, and as I said before, we've been facing many of the same issues and challenges, um, particularly focused around reduction in demand as countries across Europe went into lockdown. 
um, and that resulted in significant wholesale price reductions and changes to the energy mix across Europe with the silver lining of record breakingly low levels of carbon intensity. Um, and across the EU, uh, um, uh, energy regulators have been working to protect consumers. Uh, some of the measures that have been taken are very much focused directly on supporting consumers, such as you know, banned disconnection, bill deferral and relief. Uh, many of the measures support consumers indirectly by supporting suppliers or, or network companies. Um, and so I've mentioned in GB the network charge deferral scheme and there's, there's schemes like that. Um, and then also network companies have been able to postpone maintenance and new connections and to prioritise other COVID related work. Uh, a key theme is that many regulators responded using an agile approach to regulation. So the, the principle based rules were flexible enough to allow regulators to to respond appropriately without complex and time consuming processes. Um, and in, in the EU, um, uh, economic recovery is going to be supported by the European Commission's Green Deal aim of carbon neutrality by Europe um, it, it, by 20. 2050. So very similar theme to the Green Deal recovery in, in the UK. And so work is ongoing within SEER on continuing to respond to the challenges posed by COVID and, and developing and sharing scenarios for the, the phasing out of the transition period. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Very interesting. I'll have a few questions perhaps uh, when we move on to the discussion portion of the presentation or the uh, webinar. I think we have another polling question coming up. In this one, we ask in your country or state, has there been a significant decrease in system peak load demand due to the pandemic? And it looks like once again, there will be a rather lopsided result. Uh, let's see the results when you're ready. 82% uh, say yes. And, and the interesting question in here is, how does that peak load demand partition itself between residential and then commercial and industrial customers? Perhaps we'll talk about that shortly as well. Uh, moving on, I'm, I'm very pleased and honored to introduce Commissioner Sergei Aguignan from the Public Service Commission of Armenia and the ERA region. Uh, Commissioner Aguignan, look forward to your comments very much. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me, Commissioner? Are you muted? Can you hear me, sir? I can't hear you. Are you there? I see you, but I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Is your microphone Hello? on? There, there you are. Perfect. Oh, I switched off my mic microphone. Okay, Thank you, sir. let's. I'm sorry. So, as every other country, Armenia also faces difficulties connected with the COVID 19. A lot of businesses are closed, people stay home and don't have incomes. On the other hand, they still have obligations. They need to buy food, pay loans, and make utility payments, which is my topic today. The story is the following. Taking into account overall situation in the country on March uh, 14, uh, please go to uh, chronology slide. For, thank you very much. Uh, March 14, state of emergency was declared for one month. It was just for making possible fast response to the situation, faster adoption of legal acts, and didn't mean any essential limitations. In the reality, it didn't bring any posi positive dynamic. And finally, on March 24, Quarantine was declared with uh, full lockdown, with a lot of limitation, forced closing of number of businesses. People were allowed to go out only with documents and papers in which they had to fill 
why they went out, where they were going, how long it would take, and so on. During that time, banks, which are main tools for making payments, for receiving payments for the utilities, were working with uh, restrictions. Uh, next day, March 25, after one day of the declaration of uh, quarantine, is the deadline when utilities, after sending bills and waiting for uh, payments, are allowed to cut services off in, in case of non-payments. As a result, after declaration of quarantine, when people are urged to stay home uh, and couldn't make payments, utilities started cutoffs. We received hundreds of calls, uh, tens of articles in media about it. Utilities were blamed that they didn't take into account the situation. It is worth to say that we predicted this and uh, had discussions with our utilities. We prepared a suggestion that they delay payments for three to six months. It would require additional expenses to involve loan, which could be covered by state budget or by tariffs. So back to our March uh, uh, 25, when service interruptions were started, after hundreds of complaints, we discussed with government and commission declared force majeure for households until the end of state of emergency, April uh, 14. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, hello. Oh, thank you. That means that in case of non-payment, utilities were not allowed to cut the services. It was done only for households because people were restricted to go out and not all of them had possibility to make payments electronically. Uh, entities are able to make payments electronically and on the other hand, if they work, they have income and can pay. If they don't, they don't consume electricity or gas, so everything is okay. Consumers were happy, but the utilities stopped receiving payments from households even if some of them were able to pay. So we continued discussions with government about delaying payments. So and uh, our suggestion was, uh, please go to next slide. Mm, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, next slide. Thank you very much. So if a household consumes less than average, he or she is allowed to make payment during three months until 1st of July. You can see figures on the slide. Uh, we had six different calculations from optimistic 80% collections to pessimistic 30% collection. For March, plus about 4 billion non-payment for February, which we, we already had at that time. In drums, the deficit was from 5 billion to uh, Seven and seven, seven billion. We, uh, you can see figures also in dollars. Uh, we considered loan with six percent annual interest, and we have such a, a loans, uh, we, uh, cheap loans connected with the situation. So for three months, it would cost for uh, for us uh, from the seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. I'm sorry, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to two hundred thirty thousand uh, dollars. After a number of discussions, the government chose not to pay to utilities for loan involvement, but pay directly to consumers as financial aid. Eventually, uh, a number of support programs were launched. Uh, can I ask you to go to the previous slide? Thank you very much. First was payment of 50% of bill if consumption in February was less than 5,000 rams. Uh, I uh, brought also uh, uh, US dollar and uh, kilowatt hours to uh, to be more understandable. People were not satisf satisfied at all. Government was blamed uh, for making inefficient programs. Oppositionists said that uh, very few consumers will be uh, lie under this consumption because it is very uh, low. After this second support program was launched, 30% of bill was paid by government. If consumption is between five to ten thousand for electricity and ten to thirty thousand for natural gas, I have to mention that I am speaking about support programs which were paid directly to utilities for bills, because apart from it, number of support programs were made for vulnerable spheres, hotels, restaurants, and, and uh, residents also. As we still had bad dynamic connected with COVID-19, the state of emergency was extended till May 14. The second deadline for payments approached, uh, April 25. Collections were dramatically low because, as I said, people who were able to pay did, uh, didn't pay either uh, 
This time we started to receive complaints from utilities. They had difficulties in fulfilling their obligations to generators and for imported natural gas. So from one side, we had consumers who were complaining in social networks and the situation was also used for uh, uh, political purposes. From other side, utilities which were uh, quiet, but the economic negative impact, impact of non-collection was much higher. As we all understand, it would bring delays in their obligations, salary payments, and we would have another support sphere. That time, big portion of businesses are allowed, uh, allowed to were allowed to start their work. Banks were operating normally. People started to go out more easily. Streets again were full. So again, after agreeing with government, commission declared an uh, end of universal force majeure. We also announced that uh, every single case must be analyzed by utilities, and if somebody wasn't able to pay, he or she will not be cut it off from the service. It was the worst day for commission, because that kind of uh, bad feedback we received only in 2015, when the prices were, uh, for electricity were uh, risen by about 10%. We were blamed for acting against uh, nation, against our new government, and against humanity. So at this time, our prime minister made a Facebook live speech and explained the situation. Immediately, third support program were launched, which covered 30% of bills for consumption between 10 to 15,000 and 30 for to 40,000 for natural gas, and also for water, drinking water, also. As a result, the majority of households were benefited, including my family, which wasn't considered as a vulnerable. Because thanks God, I was working all this time and get paid fully. And also I'm not saving on electricity or gas or uh, water. Besides, not officially, we urged utilities not to cut services for uh, vulnerable households with small cons consumptions. We emphasized again that every single case will be analyzed by utilities under control of commission. Utilities and commission received hundreds of letters about delaying payments. We urged utilities not to interrupt the service if they receive a letter about uh, paying plans. Uh, our prime, prime minister had another Facebook Live and announced solidarity formula. Uh, go to next uh, slide, please which means that people who got support from government but were not in need can pay their neighbors, relatives, and uh, other people, uh, people's bill who need uh, it. A lot of people followed this formula. Commission staff also collected money and paid for consumers who wrote to us. So for now, this dissatisf satisfaction decreased. People understood that they have to pay for services if they consume. The utilities collection is about 90 to 95%, which is enough for uh, this uh, situation. And, for normal operation. Uh, so to conclude for now, because we don't uh, know how things will go, uh, we don't have issues in utilities and these sectors overall, we didn't put any burden on tariffs connected with COVID-19. Instead, government supported directly to consumers by about, uh, uh, in dollars, it will be about $10 million. Uh, so that's all, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Very interesting. And I must say, I'm not surprised that the commission was uh, attacked in a certain way politically. That seems to be a universal problem around the world. Thank yes. you for your comments. Uh, another ter uh, poll question coming up. And uh, in your country or state, who has the authority to approve an application for a change in tariffs submitted by a utility? And while you're voting, I'll remind you to submit questions through the chat function. We have received a few, and we'll be moving on shortly to a Q&A session. And once again, we're fairly unified in the answer to the question. The regulator has the authority in 92% uh, of the respondents' cases. Thank you for participating. Our fourth uh, final panelist, last but certainly not least, is Chair David Morton, the Chair and CEO of the British Columbia Utilities Commission, uh, our neighbor to the north, or in my case, north and west, uh, beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, Chair Morton, we look forward to your comments. <laughs> 
Thank you, David. Uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, or evening to all. I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the COVID-19 situation in Canada. Uh, then I'd, I'll talk, I'd like to talk about the economic implications to utilities and their customers of the, um, of the pandemic and how we as regulators can view those implications. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. The coronavirus reached Canada, at least uh, uh, as far as we can determine at this point, on January 27th. And at its peak, we were seeing around 2,000 cases a day. Almost 90% of those cases were in Ontario and Quebec, our two most populous provinces, and uh, with British Columbia having about 3% of total cases. However, throughout the country, we've been able to not only flatten, but squash the curve in Canada, in, in some places at least. And all provinces are now in a restart process. And here in British Columbia, our government modeling shows that we can increase our rate of contact to about 60% of pre-COVID normal while maintaining a low rate of transmission. I'm not exactly sure what 60% of pre-COVID contact exactly means, but um, it means that restaurants are at least half full. Um, you can go to the barber again, and um, you can uh, at least do a little bit of limited travel around the province. However, resumption to pre-COVID levels of activities is conditional on a vaccination, broad successful treatments, or community immunity. So this does mean that we'll be in this situation um, at, at this point uh, for the foreseeable future at the very least. So although the recovery has begun, the long-term economic impact of COVID-19 on utilities and their customers is yet to be known. However, there's some items I'd like to highlight. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. One of the key outcomes of the pandemic is a loss of demand, as we've uh, this has been discussed already this morning, and I'm sure everyone's very well aware of, uh, largely, at least in, in uh, our jurisdictions, largely from commercial and industrial sectors. And this is due to the economic uh, lockdown. As you can see by the charts, electricity demand fell by about 5% relative to expected levels in Alberta, New Brunswick, and British Columbia, and by about 10% in Ontario following the introduction of economic lockdowns. These reductions in sales volumes um, have brought a reduction in revenues, although the revenues may not fall by as much as the sales volumes. Since residential sales increased as people worked at home and residential rates typically have greater incremental margins in sales to commercial and industrial customers, and rate designs for larger customers generally include demand charges, uh, which are more fixed in nature than energy charges. The reduction in utility load we were seeing from COVID-19 could, however, have long-term consequences. The Ontario Independent System Operator, for example, recently cautioned the possibility of multiple waves of infection exacerbating demand forecast uncertainty, and they expect demand to retain below pre-pandemic levels for several years. In our resource planning, we are already having to deal with flat or declining loads pre-COVID and uh, significant load forecast uncertainty and increased comp competitive pressures, and the pandemic has amplified these issues. While revenues have decreased, some costs and utility costs have increased due to COVID-19. And some examples of these, and I think Howard went through some of these earlier also, uh, billing and collection related costs, uh, the need to provide uh, PPE to workers, the need to sequester control room crews for, for uh, protracted periods, um, uh, the logistical costs uh, and transfer, increased transportation costs because outside crews need to practice social distancing, they can't travel together, for example. So these costs also, um, utilities are beginning to identify and it's something we're also um, having to deal with. So next we'll look at how, how we can treat these economic, how we can treat these economic consequences of COVID. Next slide, please. Over the short term, this decrease in demand is similar to decreases that, that occur as a result of warmer weather, uh, warmer winter weather, for example. Um, here in Canada, revenue decoupling is a common way to deal with uh, those kinds of load variances. Revenue decoupling provides utilities with the comfort that the allowed revenue requirement will be recovered uh, independent of sales volumes. And the shortfall is recovered from customers over a future period or, or an overage is uh, paid back over a future period. However, consideration may still need to be given 
to when to start recovering these lost revenues from customers, given the economic burden customers are currently facing. An example of this concern is in Ontario, where the regulator allowed distributors the option of deferring for six months rate increases that were planned for this May. Utilities, with the approval of regulators, and in some cases by directions from provincial governments, have put in place initiatives to assist customers dealing with the impact of COVID-19. These include no disconnection policies, payment forgiveness, and bill deferrals. In addition, utilities have in some cases approached regulators looking for recovery of those additional costs that we've talked about. When looking at the recovery of these uh, incremental costs, as regulators, we should consider risk issues and risk allocation. What's an appropriate level of de-risking that the regulator should allow the utility? Most utilities operate in, on an approved rate of return that reflects a risk premium on capital deployed in their business. This risk premium is set by the regulator, generally speaking at least, and is based on a comparison, in a, among other things, a comparison to the way risk is generally borne by participants in the overall economy. While pandemic-related risks have in all likelihood not been explicitly recommended, uh, recognized or allocated in, in, a, in a cost of capital hearing, it's one of the risks that most businesses are exposed to, and, and generally speaking, um, they're borne by their shareholders and not their customers. So regulators must therefore consider the extent that the, the risk premium allowed to utilities should reflect that in, inherent risk relative to the rest of industry at large when we determine whether the recovery of COVID-19 related costs should be allowed. For example, there could be suboptimal outcomes if utilities did not have an incentive to take reasonable measures to mitigate any risks in bad debt as a result of COVID-19. On the other hand, um, as, as we're all aware, the utility industry is not like, uh, in many ways, is not like the rest of the economy. Um, the utilities are under an obligation to serve, for example. Um, so um, they, they can't take uh, a risk, uh, a preventative step like shutting down as many industries have, or many businesses have done. This issue could also be addressed in future cost of capital hearings. This may not be the last pandemic we face and uh, it may be a, a reasonable discussion to have in that context. In many jurisdictions at the provincial and the federal level, financial support has been provided to industry, business and customers in the form of grants and loans. The effect of this support either directly to a utility or to its customers could also be considered as it has the effect of de-risking the utility. BC, Alberta and Ontario have all started to address this issue and not all COVID related expenses have received deferral account treatment. There are also a significant number of utilities on performance-based regulation, um, Ontario, Quebec, and BC, sorry, Ontario, Alberta, and BC in particular. We have a number of utilities that are under uh, uh, longer-term PBRs. And uh, some of the utilities, these, sorry, some of these utilities have the ability to apply for exogenous factor treatment for any COVID-related expense. If, as, and when this occurs, regulators will then have to consider whether they qualify and consider these, among other things, these risk issues. Next slide, please. So I'll now give a brief overview of where we are. Sorry, I guess we got out of sequence with the slides previous, if we can go back, sorry, yes. Um, I'll now give a brief overview of where we are regarding COVID-19 related cost recovery in uh, three areas, three or four jurisdictions in Canada, as well as regulatory actions to address related utility liquid, liquidity concerns. In British Columbia, we issued a requirement that utilities could not disconnect from customers, disconnect customers for economic reasons. And we also have received applications from many utilities to allow, to allow them to defer customer payment of bills. We generally, we establish rate-based deferral accounts to record the cost of bill deferrals and increases in bad debts due to the pandemic. And in some cases, we've approved deferral accounts to track increases in expenditures due to the pandemic. However, the final disposition of these accounts will be determined at a later date. When dealing with recovery, regulators should consider all relevant impacts, both positive and negative concurrently. So we've talked about the cost increases that utilities have, have faced due to the pandemic, but utilities could also have benefited from reductions, such as reductions in fuel costs or interest rates as a result of the pandemic. One argument that we've seen 
is that uh, if in, in, ter in, in terms of the recoverability of, uh, of uh, expenditures, in incremental expenditures, is that if a customer relief program removes the opportunity for the shareholder to earn a fair return, then this would result in rates being unjust and uh, un unreasonable. And further, if a regulator does not allow uh, catastrophe insurance expenses to be flowed through to customers, or alternatively, a reasonable expected value of est annual estimated costs of the risk to be included in rates, then the regulator should allow their shareholder to recover costs in the unlikely event that a catastrophe occurs. We're also starting to hear from some utilities that receivables are up and cash flow is being impacted. We've had some liquidity related applications. For example, we recently approved an application to increase borrowing capacity. In that case, we were told that there is a significant volatility and a reduction in access to liquidity in the financial markets. And that although their current liquidity position is relatively strong, pandemic is expected to have a negative effect on cash flows. And there is a need for flexibility and capacity to act in a timely manner if and when necessary. Moving to Alberta, Alberta has a competitive electricity market. Their provincial government requested that residential small business and farm customers be able to defer their bills for three months. To facilitate this, the Alberta regulator allowed utilities to establish a rate-based deferral account for lost revenue, but they're also concerned about the effect of the three-month bill deferment on liquidity. To address this, the regulator set up a system where the balancing pool would be used to backstop electricity retailers. On the gas side, the backstop was the provincial government. These retailers would be compensated for the three-month bill deferral on application to the commission. And if approved, funds would flow from the balancing pool or government. However, most larger retailers have chosen to fund these revenue deferrals using their own credit capacity. The Alberta regulator is also deciding how the costs of the revenue deferrals should be recovered from customers. For example, if they should be spread across all customers or just from specifically affected uh, customer classes. In Ontario, the regulator ordered the establishment of deferral accounts to record the impacts of the pandemic. They ordered three accounts, cost, revenues, and billing system changes. They did this on their own motion to avoid having to deal with separate applications from the 62 electric utilities they regulate. The utility earns a short-term interest rate on the balances in those cases. Ontario also heard from utilities that a key issue was the assurance of recovery from the regulator of these deferral accounts so that they can get access to financing from lenders at reasonable rates. As a result, the Ontario regulator has commenced a consultation regarding the treatment of these deferral accounts. Interim disposal is on the table. Ontario hopes to have a final issues list in place by the end of June and discuss discuss potential answers by the end of July. The Ontario regulator has also established temporary monthly reporting requirements to monitor utility health. In Nova Scotia, by contrast, they have not received any requests for deferral accounts. Their utility stated that defaults have been fewer than they initially expected as a result of the financial assistance provided by government. Next slide, please. So I just uh, want to wrap up with uh, a, a couple uh, discussion of, uh, of uh, three other uh, post-pandemic considerations that 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 affect utilities and and and, and commissions alike, and 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 also if, and affect the uh, economic uh, can affect the economics of the utility. Uh, so these three are uh, uh, rate setting, emergency planning, and new ways of working. Regarding rate setting, the uncertainty of the economic recovery and the probability of future waves of infections will present a challenge to regulators and utilities alike when setting and reviewing operating budgets, capital planning, and setting rates. Clearly, 2020 is not an appropriate test year for revenue requirement purposes for cost of service or a base year for PBR. However, 2021 also may not be, and it's impossible to be certain that 2022 will be either. This means that regulators will need to be flexible and creative in looking at approaches to rate setting. For example, the Ontario regulator is currently looking at rebasing rates for 2021 and 2022. And one idea proposed by a utility there is to use a weather normalized average of 2017 to 2019 historicals for the load forecast in light of the uncertainty going forward due to COVID. Emergency planning. We've looked at a lot of things in isolation. Uh, we've said, what do we do in the event of a flood? What do we do if there's wildfires? And what would we do if there's a cyber attack? 
However, now we have to ask ourselves, what do we do if there's a pandemic? And more of the point, um, what if there's a, wild, a wildfire while there's a pandemic? Or what if there's a flood and a wildfire while there's a pandemic? So we're in the process here in British Columbia of asking our utilities to update their disaster plans. Companies need to lift their business continuity plans and emergency response playbooks to, to achieve a higher level, uh, to a higher level to achieve uh, normal operations. And again, we have to ask ourselves, what's the effect of, of the pandemic and, the, and how that hinders our ability to deal with other disasters? What's the effect of that on the risk profile of the utility? And finally, new ways of working. Um, the, as we've talked, uh, as other panelists have talked about, the, the uh, certainly uh, it's uh, accelerated momentum towards new ways, looking at new ways of automation and working. Even before COVID-19, there was an increasing number of jobs were transitioning and able to be performed remotely. As more employees adapt to remote work in response to the pandemic, we'll see even larger numbers of employees working remotely past in the, in the post-COVID world. At the BCUC, we're turning our attention now to opening up the, our office again. We opened up about a month ago on a volunteer basis. And um, frankly, we're not getting a lot of volunteers. Um, although I, I'm pushing for that because I know that there's some people challenged with working at home with uh, don't have large enough screen on their computers, for example. The internet's not fast enough, uh, wanted access to faster printers and so on. Um, and there's people working off the edge of their, their kitchen table or off the edge of their bed. Um, those are the younger people generally who live in smaller apartments. Um, so we need to, we need to be able to deal with 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 those issues, um, but the, however, there's a lot of people though that prefer working from home. And after the pandemic is over, it's likely, given a choice, that they would want to continue working at home. And I think that we now have to try to understand that. And I know that utilities are um, looking at that quite favorably, and and they see that as a way to reduce the uh, their office expenses and their real estate expenses and so on. So we now have a better understanding of technology and how it can be invoked in hearing situations uh, because we've had to hold um, hearings and and um, and our communication now is all over Zoom or over uh, these kinds of mediums. So that's uh, that's going to be a new normal and and I think that um, that's going to be helpful because it's going to help make even when we move back to the hearing room it will help us increase the accessibility of our hearings to people that aren't able to attend the hearing room. So I think that the normal that we do eventually get back to will be impacted a lot by what we've learned. And I think it's up to all of us to turn it into a glass half full situation rather than a glass half empty. So on that note, David, thank you very much. And thanks for everyone uh, uh, else for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Morton. <clears throat> a lot to think about uh, in, from you and from all the panelists. Uh, I want to invite all the panelists to turn their cameras back on. We do have one more poll question uh, to address while they're doing that. Did any of the utilities under your purview make a pre-filing to inform you of their intent to request certain financial relief? I think we heard a little bit about this uh, from the presenters already. And while not evenly split, this is a much closer uh, poll question than the others we've asked. The results are about 57-43. It's very interesting and perhaps jurisdictionally driven. Uh, I'd like now to go into uh, the discussion session. We have received a number of questions from participants and I'm just going to run down the line. Um, they're not necessarily aimed at anyone, but I, I I know, uh, Mr. Petrikoff, some of these are aimed at you. The first one is, should dividends be reduced before rates are increased? Howard, do you wanna chime in on that? Howard, are you on mute? Can't hear you, Howard. Yeah, I, I'm unmuted now. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Uh, uh, the, well, we're starting with the tough questions, I see. So I guess. <laughs> dive right in. Kudos to the uh, to to the audience. Um, I mean, the 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 politically correct answer is that the 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 pain of the uh, and the cost of the pandemic ought to be equitably shared across uh, ratepayers, utilities, and the and the general public. But the devil's in the details. Uh, uh, deciding where where that that is uh, I think chair Morton made a, a good point that um, you, you know we do have to look at the at the risk analysis you know how much risk should be picked up by the utility and of course that goes directly into the uh, 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 into the uh, into the Devons the other thing is that there are uh, uh, consequences of cutting expenses or um, or uh, a, a dividends that go beyond just the immediate problem. I mean, you have to maintain uh, uh, good credit ratings. You have to maintain interest in, in um, uh, uh, investors. So if it, it looks like you you get punished for for uh, efficiency, that's that's not going to help in the long run. On the other hand, it can't just be the the homeowners that 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 bear all the burden. Chair Morton, yeah, please. Yeah, um, my response to that would be that, to some extent, dividends are, uh, I'll say, they're a kind of a, a residual. Uh, they're a, a residual event. They're, they, they, they'll come after the regulator has determined what costs should appropriately be borne by the utility, and I think that that's where we should focus our, that's where we should focus our efforts. And if we can accurately or, or fairly at least determine what cost should be borne by the utility based on what our um, what our perception of, of what's a reasonably incurred costs and what what's what's prudent and and what and what degree of risk uh, they should bear, then that's what we should that's what we should make the utilities pay. And then it's up to the utilities to sort out you know what their profit is after they've after they've paid those costs, and then they can determine what portion of that profit they want to pay out in dividends to their shareholders. We're not generally we don't drive our process from the dividends backwards. Um, the dividends come at the other end of the uh, at the other end of the process. Okay. Uh, kind of a follow on, uh, Chair Morton, you did address this to some extent. Uh, the deferral accounts allow for a return of the deferred or, or missing income, uh, but should the utilities be allowed to earn interest on the deferral accounts? And if so, um, should they be made whole and not have to share the pain in some way? What should the interest rate be? It's a series of questions like that. Dr. Scott? Um, well, I was just going to say, in, in in the GB scheme that I referred to in my presentation, um, there is a, a quite a high rate of interest that the network companies are able to impose. It's the same rate of interest, um, uh, something around eight percent, as um, they they impose for for late payment. Um, I mean, I think generally, going back to the original question as well. Um, it, it is interesting how different parts of the value chain have been impacted so differently and uh, you know networks have been most sheltered in terms of impact and that's why we were encouraging them to sort of contribute through these um, deferral schemes where they um, de they offered the liquidity that was necessary but I think if you're talking about uh, what the rate of return is and, and you know the ability to pay dividends then you've got to do that through your normal regulatory mechanisms and we've got like a price, our ongoing price control is going to be looking at whether you know what the right balance is. Sure. All right. I'm not seeing any other takers. Uh, how about another tool for the toolbox? What about the use of utility securitization, creating a special charge that can be packaged and sold to investors at the AAA bond rate to replace the traditional utility's cost of capital, debt, and equity? It's a tool that's been used in other settings, other applications. Is it is it suitable for use uh, in this environment? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one a, a, as well. Um, uh, this is in, in many ways when you look to see about how we're going to finance um, 
the 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 great capital needs that we, we have for utilities securitization is something that has been discussed and experimented with um, in in some in some jurisdictions uh, probably it's going to be a tough one to to use here because there's so many unknowns we we don't know how long the pandemic's going to last. We don't know what the impact is going to be. We don't know in what areas. So that that makes the calculation of what the premium savings that comes out of securitization is going to be. And it, I think it makes it a harder case to sell for for this type of uh, the, the this type of problem. Uh, you've all mentioned lost revenues, uh, the calculation of lost revenues are important. Certainly it's part of that deferral calculation. Chair Morton talked about uh, the revenues and expenses in the categories. Uh, uh, I know in my home state that's a docket that's open where there's a stakeholder dialogue uh, to be sure that there's some agreement around what items can be and, and properly deferred and considered at a later date for recovery. Uh, but the question here is, in terms of lost revenues, what is your opinion on the measurement and recoverability of revenues lost due to load losses, service charge moratoria, uh, disconnect and reconnect fees and things like that? Are those all, uh, well, maybe the question is, how do you measure those, those uh, pieces of financial information? I think it's pertinent in all the jurisdictions. Commissioner Aguignan, have, have you some accounting methods that you're using to calculate uh, the recoverable revenues that may be lost by your utilities? Uh, uh, we calculate it as just for uh, uncollectibles, non-payments. So okay. the losses is just this, this figure, as I uh, show shown. I've shown my uh, slides, so and that's all. They, we don't uh, didn't find any uh, and didn't account any losses uh, besides these uh, uncollectibles. And for that, as a solution, we saw that they can just uh, maybe it is simplest uh, solution, but they uh, take loans and we uh, put the interest of this loan uh, in the tariff and just just that. Very good. I'm going to play rapid fire here. There's a lot of questions uh, in the queue. Uh, what data did your regulatory body require from the utilities regarding the financial conditions they faced, including customer ability to pay, load impact, revenues, and so on? I think this is asking for a little finer point on the information that was requested as you begin to analyze the financial shortfall. Okay. Um, so we are generally speak. Well, first of all, um, when this when this uh, pandemic when the pandemic first hit here, and and you know one of the first things we did when we closed our office and started working from home, is um, we reached out to all of our utilities. As uh, as uh, Dr. Scott said earlier, it was it an unprecedented period of cooperation, I would say, um, that, you know, we've never seen before. Um, you know, we actually contacted the utilities and, and talked about, uh, you know, do you, are you going to be able to continue your operations? Have you got enough personal protective equipment? Um, are, are, you know, are, are you seeing a lot of, uh, do you think you're going to have a lot of uh, disconnections? We did all of that before we did things like put disc, you no know, disconnect orders in place. Um, so it's been, a, you know, in that regard at least, it's been fairly cooperative, and the and the information that our utilities has given us have, have provided to us in the in the rate applications that they've filed for relief, relief um, they've provided us with statistics on on collections and their and their and their projections on on what they what they think they'll be able to collect and where they think their customers are going and you know looking at employment figures and 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 so on. Um, so we haven't, you know, we don't have any con concerns, I would say, about the, that, the nature of that information that we've been getting. Uh, we think it's, uh, it's pretty good. They, they've been very proactive themselves, of course. They're concerned about, they're concerned about their bottom lines and, and uh, 
they're tracking this data um, quite closely. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's, that's where we've been. Okay. Um, to what extent do you believe, this is asking for a bit of a projection, but to what extent will the delayed payments uh, for network charges Will they, will they result in prolonging and widening the negative economic impact? Maybe I should read that again. I, I think I followed this one up. Please ask the panel to what extent the delayed payments for network charges are going to result in prolonging and widening the negative economic impact. Any crystal ball gazers, Dr. Well, Morton? Well, just as a general comment, um, um, a delayed a delayed payment um, is going to benefit one party um, and possibly to the detriment of the other party. So it probably helps the people who can delay their payment. It helps their economic recovery, uh, but it it may not help the economic recovery of the uh, of the pay of the payee. Um, so that means that the pay, as we've discussed here, that means the payee has to make other other arrangements to to you know cover the cash that they're they're not getting in. Um, however, what, what globally uh, does it benefit the economy to the extent that it helps uh, it helps the consumer to uh, to survive and drive demand? Then uh, it, yes, it, it may well be helpful. That's my crystal ball gazing for today. I, I would go along with that. It's it's a balancing act. Uh, there's a time value to money. Anytime you're going to delay the, re the recovery of those funds, there's going to be a, an implicit cost. Um, at the moment, what we're seeing is, you know, fairly low interest rates. So it could be that, that, that buying the extra time, relatively speaking to what things will be in the future, will be beneficial. On the other hand, there's been a lot of government borrowing out there, and we could certainly see a, a wave of of inflation, in which case the cost of that borrowing could become dear in the in in the in the future. So it, it's th this is not unusual. We we do this all the time when, when we figure in what portion of a capital structure is going to be borrowed. Right. With I mean, revenues, I, 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 I would agree that it's very much. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um... No, I, was, I would agree. It's very much. It, it's a quite a, a challenging balance to hit between, uh, you know, when we um, supported the uh, network charges to referral uh, scheme. There is a there, there was a concern. One of the risks was um, that you are funding failing suppliers who are working in a competitive market and who it might be better ultimately to let them fail rather than um, store up more debt and that have to be uh, smeared. Um, across uh, across all co consumers, but against that, there are concerns about the sort of risk to consumers of wide scale supplier failure at a certain point. And so we try to get the balance right by making the scheme um, ha having to make a contribution. You don't get everything free, and it's only for a limited time period. And we'll just have to keep under review how that works. Uh, Dr. Scott, you mentioned the green recovery uh, program. Uh, again, in my home state, I know the commission is talking about uh, a stimulus, recovery stimulus investments program using their economic development authority, uh, which does vary from state to state. The question posed was with revenues and cash flows under stress, is now the best time to accelerate clean and green energy programs? Dr. Scott, maybe you want to start by uh, commenting on the decision to well, to do just that. Yeah, um, so we haven't made any decisions yet. We are, and, and obviously the government is in in the um, in the driving seat on green recovery. We're we're just thinking about as the regulator, what can we do to support and align ourselves with that. And so when I was talking about sort of accelerated investment, this is investment that would ultimately be. Um, you know, subject to a, a price control if you're investing in EV points and, and things. So it's it's it gives that sort of security to the businesses that um, it, it, we're not asking. You know, I, I don't think that would cause problems with cash flow. The kind of the kind of projects that we're talking about. 
Uh, to what extent have individual regulators in your jurisdiction been involved in stakeholder outreach as you work on these issues, or is that something that's left totally to the regulatory staff? I think this is a culture question, perhaps inside your agencies. Sorry, do you mean we personally been involved? In Sorry, that? I didn't quite. I, I think it. Yeah, I'll read it again. I think the the question is to what extent have commissioners actually been involved in outreach in the jurisdiction, or is that something the staff has done? That's that's the it's way I read this question. Yeah, it's typically it's typically in our jurisdiction, commissioners have not been involved in that, but you know, for for reasons of you know perceived bias and 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 so on, it's it's just not an activity that commissioners have have generally been involved in, although um, commission, uh, commission, commissioners will um, conduct uh, community input sessions uh, regarding specific topics or specific applications, but um, commissioners haven't been on the phone with uh, uh, people generally about the COVID situation, if that's, if that's what the question is getting at. And, and perhaps Commissioner Aguignan, you, you could help us understand a little bit of the communication your agency has had with your regulated utilities. Have the staff engaged with these regulated entities to better understand their needs? Uh, has it, have you personally been in, involved in those conversations? Thank you. Yes, I have been personally involved in this. I very uh, on phone all this time until the maybe the 11 or 12 o'clock of, of the night and the prime minister was the uh, on the other uh, end of the line and the utilities were there so everybody were involved maybe we didn't speak with the uh, people with the consumers but the entities we we were speaking and communicating with entities all this time without any uh, night or day without any uh, time limit so uh, our chairman and uh, everybody and government also uh, parallel with us perhaps you might want to say a word about the division of duties between your office and the ministry the ministry of energy uh, uh, how are these uh, uh, pieces of of work uh, separated in in armenia uh, connected with COVID-19, with the uh, state of emergency, uh, everything by law, everything, uh, uh, every decision have uh, to be, uh, have to come from the gov government. So if uh, we have some, uh, any decision, we have to agree it with them. So the main decision maker in this situation, emergency situation is the government. Uh, if, uh, if there is no emergency situation, we have a lot of independency and we have, uh, we are deciding, uh, for example, uh, red cases, we are deciding, deciding ourselves. Uh, but uh, to put, as I said before, to put interest rate of the, the COVID-19 impact to the tariff, that type of decision in this situation uh, should come from the government, not from the ministry, because uh, unfortunately now we don't have a Ministry of Energy. It is uh, merged with the other ministry and uh, main decisions are uh, made by the uh, prime minister or vice uh, prime minister very good thank you um another question about cost savings we're seeing huge cost savings from o m reduction and fuel costs from reduced operation of coal plants in the u.s how should regulators ensure that those savings are delivered to customers immediately to soften economic stress due to the pandemic. Well, to a degree, yeah, to a degree that that may already be be taken care of, depending on the rate design of the electric utility in in the jurisdiction. Um, it's very common to have fuel adjustment clauses, in which case the actual uh, fuel costs are flowed through. Um, and there is a, a you know a, a balancing. You, you, there's a, a, a rate that's in place, and then it's compared with the actuals, uh, and then and then adjusted on a, on a regular basis. If if the if you have a um, 
uh, if fuel is running through a fuel adjustment clause, this is happening already. Um, if if fuel is basically in the base rate, then then it doesn't get changed until you have a base rate case, um, and that may be something that that um, it, it would make sense to to figure in if you if we're going to have we talked about emergency or, or rate adjustments, something that would be be weighed then when we would go for one of the other uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, adjustments. So it basically depends on where you're starting from, and it'll be different with you know different jurisdictions and different utilities, and, and then sort of figuring that that in. Okay, I'm going to sneak in. Oh, Commissioner, please. Uh, we don't have, uh, in our case, from our case, we don't have big differences in these uh, expenses, and our utility says they uh, they will uh, cover it. Uh, no, the works they didn't do uh, the, in the first half of the uh, year, they will uh, cover on the second half. So we don't have uh, big uh, differences in these uh, expenses. Very good, thank you. Uh, residential customers have generally paid more than their fair share of fixed costs. If utilities are granted recovery for lost revenue, should residential customers be required to pay for the shortfall too? Always have to watch out for questions that come from former utility commissioners. They can be tricky. So the premise is that the residential sector has paid more than their fair share of fixed costs. Why should they continue to pay for the shortfall too? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, you know, I get that's, um, you know, certainly, I think that that's a reasonable, uh, um, you know, reasonable thing to to uh, to consider. Um, you know, you'd want you'd want to make sure that that is in fact the case uh, um, that uh, they paid they have been paying more than their share, and perhaps you might want to adjust the rate design so that so that going forward that's that's not the case. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, so you you want to know why that's happening, and 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 it's possibly better to fix that problem. Uh, at, at its core, rather than rather than have a band-aid solution and say, well, this, or an opportunistic solution and say, well, this is an this is an opportunity that's come along to 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 help that. So so let's uh, you know let's take advantage of it. Um, but um, you know that's certainly, I guess there's justification for it certainly. Well, the 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 key here is you know is is the is, I, I is, think I'm sorry. Go on, Dr. Scott. Uh, no, I, I was. I, you go ahead first, Tom. Okay, I, I was just going to point out that, you know, in in rate cases, and when you listen to the opening statements from all of the of the participating parties, that they generally start with, you know, my, my client, you know, whether it's the industrials yeah. or the re, uh, residentials or the commercial, you, you know, if if you look at an accurate cost of service study, we are paying a disproportionate share, and those are yeah. always rather tough factual uh, 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 problems to, to sort out, but they are the kind that do get sorted out, out in rate cases. And that brings you to, to I guess, back to your earlier comment. When it comes time for assessing the, the, the cost of the pandemic, and the pandemic is going to have a, a cost and looks like it might be a sizable one, it should be equitably dis distributed. And at that point, it does make sense to take a look at those, um, cost of service studies to see who, who is paying what and making that decision on what is an equitable allocation of the, the cost of, of dealing with the pandemic. Dr. Scott? Um, yeah, sorry, can you still hear me? I've got some yes, me yes. message saying things are slow. Um, I, I was just going to add that it's an interesting question about how to treat industrial and commercial consumers in the in in the context of the kind of economic crisis that we're that we're dealing with, and uh, you know th these issues have come up about the the balance. Um, but I agree that I entirely agree that you have to come up with an equitable solution. I think we're approaching the end of our time. I will 
I will simply put one lumped question on the table, perhaps not for response. I think it goes back to things folks have said before that part of this process will involve uh, separating uh, bad debt before and after COVID, revenues before and after, some, some good solid uh, uh, record building to be sure that the financial arguments are sound and on the table so that there's transparency, there's, there's accountability, and there's equity for all of the customer classes. Uh, to the commercial and industrial, I, I think the, the, the prospect of, again, demand destruction is real. And, I, and, I, and I'm afraid we're not gonna know how that shakes itself out for some time. Uh, let me just close by thanking the panel. Uh, a, a terrific conversation. Thank the audience for all those good questions. Uh, remind you that this webinar will be recorded and available uh, as well as the slide deck. Uh, with that, uh, thank you to everyone and uh, have a wonderful day or an evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, everyone.